You are listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm joined by author Ellen Hampton, who's returning to the podcast to discuss a word that to many Americans evokes the idea of a cheap plastic trinket, but that in France is linked to the complex interplay between personal and collective memory. Souvenir. Welcome back to the podcast, Ellen. I'm so happy to have you back. For those listeners who might not have been familiar with the first episode you came on to the podcast for, could you just give us a little bit of information about who you are, what you do here in France, and your recent book project? Hi, Emily. Thanks. I'm delighted to be back and to talk about history and different historical aspects. I am a historian. Please don't run away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, an author. I used to teach at Sciences Po, and uh, now I'm just dedicating myself to books. I had in um, 2021 a uh, second edition of a book I wrote called Women of Valor, The Rochambelles on the World War II Front. And then this April, it came out in French with Talendier, Les Rochambelles. So that was very exciting. And I have a new book coming out in March in English through LSU Press called Doctors at War. And that looks at the medical profession under the occupation, under the Nazi occupation in the 1940s. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, maybe we'll get to talk about medicine under the occupation at some point, too. That'll be fun. I would love to do that. And I think the, the occupation in World War II is a period of time that continues to fascinate people around the world. You know, we the wealth of both historical and fiction books about World War II in the United States just seems unceasing. I've spoken with people in, you know, publishing who are just amazed that we continue to want to know more about this story, but it's so complex. And so I'm so glad that you're here to talk about it and about the word that we've selected for today, which is one that I'm really excited to dig deeper into because it's a word that means such different things when you evoke it in English or in French, and it's the word souvenir. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, no, it's, it's an interesting choice of word because it is so different in the two languages. And the difference is a little bit of a reflection of the culture as well. In English, it's a flimsy, cheap, tacky merch kind of thing, a gadget toy, something you buy to represent a culture, a place, or an event. So in that sense, a plastic tank model stands in for the D-Day invasion on the Normandy beaches. But in French, souvenir is deep and wide. You know, it's a verb. It's also a noun. It's the act of remembering and the memory itself. So it's also a reflexive verb, je me souviens. Huh? So it emphasizes the personal. But le souvenir can be held both by an individual and a community. Mm -hmm. And in the community, it becomes commemoration or sort of actively remembering in a ceremonial way. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And, and I completely neglected to think about the reflexive nature of the verb when I was, you know, thinking about this episode. But you're absolutely right. You know, for those who didn't suffer through French conjugation in school, well, first of all, what are you doing listening to this podcast? No, but souvenir, I mean, reflexive verbs require the, there's a doubling up of the agent of the verb. You are both uh, subject and object of that verb. And so it, it really wraps that active nature into the person who's speaking. And I think that's especially interesting when we're talking about souvenir as a culture and maintaining kind of a cultural or public memory in addition to just one's private recollections. Yeah, it kind of separates the personal from the community, the individual from the community. And, and that separation doesn't really occur in American memory. You know, the memory is supposed to be one static thing that we all agree on. And of course, that's impossible. So the French allowance for having the personal memory, je me souviens, and the community memory of a more formal sort allows for some differences in flexibility that perhaps American memory doesn't, you know? Yeah. And this is something I really want to get into. And this this division like that you're mentioning about personal memory versus public memory, I think 
specifically when it comes to occupation and the Shoah and France's role in sort of collaborationist initiatives is something where we do see that division quite starkly. You know, I think there's several elements to this. One that I definitely want to address is, well, I think we can we can talk about things from a positive and a negative stance when we talk about France's role in the occupation. Let me back up for a second because you and I both are already knee deep in this and anybody who isn't aware of France's role in the occupation, you know, Cliff's Notes version, we have capitulation uh, in 1940 and then very quickly we have the division of France into an occupied and an unoccupied half. France's government moves down to moves down south from Paris to Vichy and we have collaboration with the Nazi occupier. Is that have I misconstrued any no, of no, that? No, no, that's exactly it. Okay. Absolutely. And so at this point, we have a couple of different things that are happening. We have like a public-facing collaborationist government in Vichy. We have also a resistance. And then that resistance, I think, we're almost going to retcon the memory of it following the occupation and maybe misconstrue it as being more pervasive. I think a lot of people who lived through this once occupation is over, we're proud to say, yes, I was part of the resistance. But as far as I can tell, it seems as though more people claimed to have been part of the resistance than there were actually active members of the resistance. Is that is that sort of retconning of memory? Does that seem accurate to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was it was almost a joke that after the um, Paris was liberated, everybody was a resistant. And so people were trying to launder their reputations by getting endorsed getting their card from the defense ministry saying they had been a resistant, you know, and so applications were filed that had absolutely no basis. I even ran across one. The guy was a, an informer for the Gestapo. He got loads of people killed and he tried to get a resistance card, you know, and his, <laughs> his, uh, former colleagues wrote to say, absolutely not. This guy is, is, a uh, he sold us all out. Anyway, it was a time of, extraordinary difficulty and people did, you know, historians have kind of broken it into groups of those who collaborated actively, those who had a lot of interaction with the Germans and maybe profited from the occupation, but weren't really collaborators. Those who avoided the Germans and just got on with their lives. And then those who were active resistance and the active resistance were the smallest group. Okay. And do you have an approximate I've heard all sorts of numbers being thrown around and I don't want to cite anything, you know, without any basis, but do you know approximately how many French adults were part of the were actively part of the resistance during the occupation? I think they named about 100,000 certified resistance. So okay. out of at that time there were about 42 million French. Okay. So it's it's a small group, but necessarily. You of know, course. It, you can't have everyone being a resistant and keep Vichy and, and the Germans in charge. So no, absolutely. And and that division that you highlighted of the different groups, I think if anybody is really interested in this period of time, aside from also obviously reading Ellen's books, I would definitely recommend tuning into a television show that was made a couple of years back called Un Village Francais, A French Village, yeah. where they do a really good job of showing just the various ways in which, you know, regular people had to face, you know, this without knowing what was going to come next, because that's another part of memory is that hindsight's twenty twenty. We know now, and that and the people who were trying to get their resistance cards knew then that that was the group you wanted to be a part of. After the fact, exactly. After the fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After the fact. Well, Jean Paul Sartre lived in Paris through the occupation, and he wrote a really wonderful essay afterwards about what it had been like. And he said every choice they made led them to evil. That mm. there was just no good option anywhere. Everything they did compromised their moral values. So it was a really difficult time. And it, I think that that difficulty means that, you know, exploring this through the lens of memory makes it so difficult. People consistently ask themselves, what would I have done if I were in this situation? You know, Jean Jacques Goldman has a whole song about. You know, if I had been 17 years old and growing up in Germany, what would I have done if that had been my, if those had been my choices? So, mm -hmm. so I want to address a bit one specific element of 
public memory when it comes to the occupation and specifically to the Shoah. Following World War II, official communication regarding France's collaboration was pretty glossy, maybe, and it took a really long time for France to publicly acknowledge its role in collaborationist initiatives and in the Shoah. Could you kind of explain a little bit how and why it took so long for France to publicly acknowledge that and what eventually led to public acknowledgement? Well, when Paris was liberated in August of 1944 and Charles de Gaulle came back from uh, from England, he insisted that the Vichy government had been a regime and that the French state had continued to exist in the colonies represented by his free French. Il faut savoir oublier was his motto. Let's just put this behind us. So keep in mind that at that time, uh, at least 10,000 French were assassinated in extrajudicial purges after liberation. Uh, People were out for blood for what had happened during the years of the occupation. Legally speaking, collaboration charges, which were described as damage to the national dignity and damage to the unity of the French, were brought against more than 300,000 French. And about 20% of the police force was fired. So it's not as though a curtain was drawn and no one admitted there had been any wrongdoing. There was admission. Of course, it's put on individuals. The problem was France wasn't ready to admit fault as a nation until Jacques Chirac comes along in 1995. Why does it take so long? Because Jacques Chirac was the first post-war president who could claim total innocence in the period. He was 10 years old in 1942. François Mitterrand, you may remember, had worked as a civil servant for the Vichy government until 1943, when he switched sides to the resistance, finger to the wind there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he followed de Gaulle's line that it wasn't a government, it was a regime. Therefore, it doesn't count. You know, this this is very French. I always laugh about this, but as every perpetrator in every French drama says at least once, ce n'est pas ma faute, je ne suis pas responsable, je n'avais pas de choix. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of what happened, and it took a long time to get there. But now, since none of the individuals were involved, it's not so hard for them to say, we did the wrong thing. We were complicit as a state, as a government. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's that. And that fault thing is another, I mean, foot is another one where I just feel like that's a whole, that's a whole other episode. But there is this sort of I'm not personally responsible, therefore I can't take credit or... Yeah, that's a whole other episode. Yeah, whole other episode. <laughs> right. But yes. No, absolutely. Okay. So so finally, we have Jacques Chirac publicly acknowledging Vichy, publicly acknowledging France's role. And in the ensuing years, we've started to see evidence of France's collective reckoning, collective memory made public. I'm thinking memorials, plaques, reenactments... How have you seen France sort of acknowledge this collective memory in your life, in your research? Well, for the Shoah specifically, you have the Memorial de la Shoah, which is in Paris and which opened, uh, I don't remember exactly when, but it's a terrific institution. It's a museum and it's a research center and they have collected the testimonies of people, what they suffered, what they saw, who they knew. Um, It's just a a fantastic resource for anybody who's working on the period. And they have regular conferences and events, and they do tours of Drancy, where the the public housing complex, where the Jews had been just dumped with no food, no facilities, nothing in 1942. So there's a lot of work going on to keep the memory of the Shoah in the public eye. They work with schools. They have a, that's not a contest, um, concours. Uh, every year, they have another question each year um, about the the Shoah and, and the children write essays on it. So there's a lot that goes on in terms of memory of the Shoah itself. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Storytime in Paris, where each week host Jennifer interviews a different author about his or her book set in Paris or France. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. And I think you were recently at a reenactment that pertains to this time period. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of who organized that and and how it unfurled? 
Oh, it was great. I was with them in Barenton in Normandy. It's a, it's a pretty small town to commemorate the 78th anniversary of the liberation of the town. And so a student, a 20-year-old student from Rouen University organized the uh, reenactment. When, when we say reenactment, they're not actually doing a whole lot of things, but they bring, um, they wear vintage uniforms and they bring real uh, authentic vehicles from uh, the World War II era. So they had motorcycles. They were so loud back then. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, Jeeps. And even they even had a half track, which is pretty amazing. And the town was decked out in American and French flags. And there was a, a ceremony. It coincided with a conference about some Jewish children who had been hidden in the town during the occupation. And Sarah Harvell, who is a friend of mine and an historian, and she found these families. Uh, she found the families and they all came and the village acknowledged their, uh, you know, their relationship kind of. They had been their children, sort of. But for the reenactment part, I talked to one of them to see why, you know, his name is Jérôme Even. He was 51-year-old French army veteran from near Gonville. And they're all in U.S. uniforms, you know, and these are U.S. vehicles. He finds and collects artifacts from the war and keeps them in display cases in his home. So when there's a name on an item, like a dog tag, or he, he talked about a bag, I, I don't know how to translate that, but it's a, it's a specific military bag and it had a guy's name on it. He tracks down the soldier. So he has photographs and some biographical information on them as well. And I was really impressed with his commitment to the memory of these men from 80 years ago. He, I mean, he's only 51. He was not even there. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And he said, we must not forget all these young Americans who came of their own free will to liberate Europe from fascism. So, yeah, in theory, but he said what really happened on an emotional level was his parents took him to the American cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer in Normandy. It's on the beaches, the D-Day beaches, when he was just a boy. And he was completely taken by the size of the sacrifice that rolls out. They've got 172 acres of lawns there with graves. And so ever since, he's been collecting the traces and the lives that, you know, that they left in France. So it was pretty impressive for me. That sounds incredible. And yes, yeah, for those who, um, who saw, uh, what was it? The one with Matt Damon. The World War II movie with Matt Damon, that's the, that's the American Cemetery in Colville, so that you're talking about, and I can't remember the name of that. Oh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. It's that, it's that cemetery. There we oh, go. Oh, okay. Was that Matt Damon? That was Tom Hanks, right? And Matt Damon was in it as, they were, yeah, it was like a big... Uh, oh, he was. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Matt Damon was Private Ryan, and Tom Hanks was the guy who was saving him. Oh, right. It's been it's a while. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's this... Franco-American overlap that we're talking about here. And obviously, you know, we're both American and, and the American army liberated France. But I think that it's also interesting to sort of explore the ways in which you kind of alluded to this at the beginning of our conversation, the difference between France's attitude towards its collective memory and America's attitude towards its collective memory, because collective memory can be mutable, as we've seen a little bit with sort of the attitude towards collaboration and the fact that, as you mentioned, Jack Chirac was the first person who, because he had no personal memory associated with this period, could kind of change the conversation around the collective memory towards the Shoah. Right now in the United States, we're seeing a, a huge reckoning with uglier parts of our past with, you know, statue teardowns and renamings of high schools and just sort of grappling with things that we've put into the collective memory that we're maybe not so pleased to have there anymore. Do you see the same kind of mutability or public reckoning with memory in France regarding this period? Yeah. And, you know, both nations have entrenched camps that will not be moved by the facts and who insist that their own narrative is true, quote unquote, and no one else's is, you know, like history can be divided into true and false. And it depends on who's talking. It depends on how you assemble your facts and what narrative you make of the facts. The facts are there for sure. But what you do with them is, is different. In France, we recently had to endure the twisted propaganda of Eric Zemmour during the last presidential campaign, for example. 
And there are regularly Holocaust deniers and the like who surface to, you know, spew their bile all over everyone. But here, I think I think the major difference between France and the U.S. is in the laws on speech, because France has laws against hate speech and the U.S. has absolute freedom of speech. So even if it's hateful, you have the right to say it. Now a certain American contingent is turning that around and banning books and teaching material with, with which they disagree, you know, trying to fix the historical narrative firmly in their own political frame. This is true and this is what has to be taught as opposed to any other interpretation we're going to decide is, is wrong. And, you know, from Savonarola forward, that has never worked. Uh, if they understood history at all, they would understand that this is failure when you start trying to ban information. So, yeah. So while Confederate reenactors continue to draw huge followings in the States, in France, there's no commemoration of the Vichy government or Marshal Pétain, but there's certainly discord over the war in Algeria, for example. And, and that is still so fraught that even the commemoration date is contested. <laughs> they wow. can't even agree on what date should be commemorated. So you can see how that is. And uh, yeah, and so in France, you have the liberation of France after the Nazi occupation is kind of an event everybody can get around and celebrate. It draws a lot of joyful reenactment. And it's not so much about war as it is about the end of a long, dark night. Yeah, yeah I was in um, Cannes this summer and they did a reenactment for, I mean, I, I wasn't as in it as you obviously were in this one you just went to in Normandy. But when I went to the liberation commemoration in Cannes, you have, yeah, French men decked out in American GI uniforms. And it is just this, you know, there's fireworks. It just feels like it feels like the 4th of July. It feels like a big celebration of freedom. So you brushed up against something that I'd love to hear a little bit more about, which is this French banning of hate speech. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that actually looks like insofar as what's actually banned and how is this upheld in France? Well, I can tell you a little bit about the history of it. It was this came up during the Third Republic it, before the occupation. There was a lot of tension and conflict between groups of immigrants who were arriving in France because of persecution in Eastern Europe. And so the government passed a law saying that you could not instigate hate between groups based on race or ethnicity. This law was repealed by Vichy within minutes of their taking office. <laughs> and then they brought it back after the war. It, it basically doesn't allow you to publish hateful things. I don't know the details of exactly what is banned and what is not and how it, how it comes about. But the difference is the contrast between absolute free speech in the States and modified speech. It seems to me that with social media... Uh, and Twitter banning people from saying certain things and, and other, you know, social media groups that we're moving towards a modified speech, that absolute free speech is probably going to take a hit or two. And, you know, you can argue either way, but it works for France. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And for example, I think Holocaust denial is is built into that. For example, it's 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 illegal to publicly deny the Holocaust in France. Exactly. And I think that this is something that I've seen a lot, you know, in my research, which was linked to the sort of values of equality and liberty that were at the heart of the Enlightenment era philosophies upon which both France and the United States based their sort of revolutions and the formation of their ensuing republics is that you can't have both absolute equality and absolute freedom you have to lean one way or the other. And in the United States, we leaned a little bit more towards freedom. And in France, they leaned a little bit more towards equality. And so we value both in both countries, ostensibly. But in France, we do often see these things that to an American eye can seem like, oh, you're impeding my freedoms. But actually, it's just in the service of maybe greater equality, greater I don't know, humanity, what what would you, you know, what what do you think sort of the, if you had to guess the value in France that's leading us towards protecting people from hateful speech? Why is that valued in France? Well, I think, I think in France, they lean more towards the community and protecting the community. Whereas in the United States, the preference or the, the priority is the individual. So the individual's rights are what you hear about all the time in, uh, in the States, 
Whereas in France, they're talking about what's right for the community. And this has, you know, economic impact all over the place. And and I think we're really seeing it in a negative way in the States right now with this inequality that's been so exaggerated and exacerbated by by recent events. But the speech and communication and expression, if it hurts the community, they're going to stop it in France. And if it hurts the individual, they're going to stop it in the States. So yeah, it's it's a it's a different path along a, sort of the same direction, but but it takes different priorities. And I just want to say thank you again so very much for coming back on the podcast. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you. And for anyone who is interested in uh, hearing more about Ellen's work, reading more about Ellen uh, about Ellen's work, you definitely should check out her books. We're going to put links to both of them in the show notes. Um, and where else can people find you, Ellen? Are you on social media? Uh, do you have a podcast of your own? Just yours. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I have a website. It's ellenhamptonbooks.com. And uh, I keep I I try to keep it current with different articles. I, I write articles sometimes for uh, different publications and uh, and any books that are you know coming up would be on there. So yeah, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, it's your subjects are always very interesting. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. This has been navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.